Good morning. Scripture reading this morning would be in the book of Luke. If you would open your Bibles to chapter 16, verses 10 through 3. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And the congregation said, Amen. Thank you, Phil. It's good to see all of you guys today. I know we're going to be losing some snowbirds soon, but uh, it's really great to have all of you guys here and uh, the singing just sounds so good and just being able to worship together and we feel like you're part of us all year long, but you know, if you have to go, come back. <laughs> We've been talking about Foundation for Change for a while and just being able to figure out what some of those foundation things are. And, uh, of course, it begins, first of all, with our salvation, and we're saved by grace, but then the question becomes, well, what do you do? And so we've been talking about some of the things that we do, and I don't know if you're aware or not, but I've been following, basically, the Ten Commandments. And so if you're familiar with those, those are kind of the beginning stage where God says, you know what, here's what I want, and he speaks from the mountain, and he tells them, this is what I want, and this is core, and this is the things that I want you to know. Those are mostly repeated, all except for one in the New Testament. And so I feel like those fit as well now as they did back then. And Jesus makes some adjustments in them as to what they are and exactly what they're like. And so we haven't approached them from God told you this, because I know what happens then. You say, but I don't have to and I'm not going to, and we tend to get a little rebellious. And so what I want you to realize is these are just some of the foundation things that are just the beginning of life, and they're gonna make your life better if you can follow these. And so this is the next step once you know what those are. We've been talking about these. We need to know who God is and know what God is and be able to honor God, that he is our God and, and that we believe in him. We need to worship him and keep what's holy. We need to respect his name. We need to know who family is and we need to honor family. And those things are very, very important as well because that's one of the things that God gives us. We need to be honest with a lot of things and all of these tend to fall into the attitude of or into emotions or attitudes or something like that be honest with violence and possessions and sex and lying and getting what you want because sometimes we're going to struggle with those anger is always one of those things that gets a little bit difficult so he interprets the phrase, do not kill, I'm going to say don't get angry. And so Jesus redoes that. He says, don't steal somebody's stuff. I want you to have stuff enough to share because you worked for it. He says, be sure that sex is with the right wife, the wife, the one that's yours, not somebody else's. Uh, truth is important. Don't lie. Always tell what's right. And then desire is, you know, desire the right thing. Desire what God wants you to have, not what everybody else has. We tend to look around everybody else and say, I want one of those. And so when you look at these, it's a little bit difficult for us. And of course, anger is one of the things that's, you know, important for us not to let get out of hand, unless it's in traffic, right? Because God may make exceptions for traffic. Or, you know, when the story gets a little bit bigger than what it needs to be, 
if it's talking about fishing, then exaggeration or those things are okay. Uh, don't lust, you can look a lot, don't want what somebody else has, go ahead and buy yourself the newer one, right? Because then you don't lust after what they have. No. God is saying, let me give you what I want you to have. Can we trust God to do that? Can we trust God to be able to say, I'm going to accept whatever you give me and I'm not going to worry about the rest of it? Because most of our problems are solved if we can just get these things right. If we don't get these right, then we are constantly trying to catch up. And that's why I say these are the foundation things. So if you have problems with anger, it's going to be problems with anger all the way through everything that you do. If you have issues with lust, it's going to be issues all the way through. And it's going to be in everything in your life. And it's really hard to make any further advancement if you haven't dealt with those things first. If it's really hard to tell the truth... And just be honest, not only with yourself, but with other people about who you are and where you are and what you are, because we always want to make ourselves look better. He says, you're going to have trouble all the way through. And so these are just basic things. I want you to know these. I want you to understand these core elements, because most problems are solved if you can just get these right. And so being able to have these means that we are able to change our life and have something better. How many of you have the perfect life right now and you don't need to change at all? I thought there'd be one or two. Goodness. All right, so for the rest of us, that's where it begins. But I don't know that that's the ending of it all. So if you want to have better results, Life starts at the core. But it also starts with how well you do it. So I want you to realize that. The passage that Phil has read to us from Luke is, let me give you the context. In 15, he talks about the prodigal son. And he talks about a son who takes everything, runs away, and eventually comes back to a loving father. And then he starts with the unrighteous servant who has all his master's goods, but he's just not doing it well. He's wasteful. You know, and so when he comes to him, he says, why are you wasteful? It's not that he's completely dishonest, he's just sloppy. And maybe a little bit dishonest, maybe he just doesn't pay attention to anything. And so you get the impression that this guy is, he's not somebody you can trust. And so, he says, I'm good. you're fired, basically. Get your affairs in order. Things are going to be done. Charges are brought against him for wasting the master's possessions. And it specifically says that. He's not really the thief who's embezzled everything. He just hasn't paid attention. And I don't know if that strikes a chord with you, but I think I see a lot of people like that. They're going through life and they just not really paying attention because everything's kind of okay, it's kind of good, it's not that bad, and you know, we just do whatever we can, which means don't trouble me very much. Don't get me too excited, don't make it anything difficult. And then he gets fired because that was his attitude. He didn't do details. He didn't take care of things. And so when Jesus gives you the interpretation of this, he says the guy who's faithful is going to be faithful in little things, in big things, in everything. And if you have trouble being faithful and paying attention to details and being able to do something right, he says you're going to have trouble with the big things. You're going to have trouble with the job. You're going to have trouble with relationships. You're going to have trouble with righteousness. You're going to have trouble with all kinds of things if you can't get the details right. And so as we look at the, the parable and look at Jesus' conclusion here, he says, well, what if somebody wants to give you real reward? They're going to look at, can he even handle it? Even in the parable of the talents, he gives each one 
according to his ability, right? So the first one gets five, the next guy gets two, and the next guy gets one, and the last guy proves I can't even handle one. And that's really what it is doing. He's saying, well, you know, I couldn't even handle one. And so God says, well, I'm going to take that one away from you too. I think this is important for us and critical, critical for us to realize this. It gives the example here of a guy who really, he says criminals understand this. They know how to make better relationships because of what they're doing. And so he... Uh, cheats on the books and he says you know what you owe my master a hundred bushels of wheat just just go ahead and write 50 write 80 and he goes through and reduces everything so he says let me prove to you that I'm not really that honest and I'll take my dishonesty and I'll be just as dishonest and irresponsible as I've always been and Jesus point is you've only got one master you only got one person, and you really need to focus on God. It's, it's kind of confusing as to why Jesus would tell this story. But I think he's trying to say that the details show the quality of work. The details show our allegiance. The details show what our life is about. Because if you're faithful in everything, that's what God wants. And so pay attention to the details. If you get the little details, then you don't have to worry about all the big stuff. That will already be done. And so don't be overwhelmed. Just take care of the small things. Being moral, being honest, being trusted, being all of those things we've talked about as far as the foundation, and do them well. We have differences in how we see things, right? So if you tell your child, clean your room, what does that mean? To you, it means put everything where it belongs. To him, it means stuff everything under the bed. It's clean, right? If you help tell your husband, clean off the table, it's clean, right? Sorry, we don't dust. I don't know why we don't dust, but we just don't dust. It's clean. There's nothing on it. What are you talking about? Well, are you paying attention to the detail of what that might really mean? So when you tell your kids to be good, what does that mean? Usually it means don't get caught. No, that's not what that meant. That means I want you to, what, not break anything? Or I want you to actually behave in a way that's going to bring honor to your parent. Those are very different, aren't they? So when God asks for obedience, what does he mean? Don't get caught, right? Or should we behave in a way that brings glory to God? Seems like that would be the best one of what he's looking for. What does it mean to be spiritual? What does it mean to be holy? What does it mean to be the body of Christ? Is there any details to that where we should act in a certain way in order to bring glory to God, in order to fulfill everything that he has? When we pray, we want answers from God, but you know, do we really pray expecting the answers from God? Are we focused on that as a detail? Or is it just like, well, you know, thank you for air, water, food. Now I lay me down to sleep. But when Jesus talks about prayer, he says prayer moves mountains. Maybe we just never noticed that we could have a prayer life that would actually move a mountain. So how much do you pray? How good is your worship? Do we just come and sit or do we actually engage? Gabby's up here singing and we go, yeah, just mumble along with him. There's a reason we do the words. There's a reason there's a book. There's a reason there's notes. There's a reason. And let me just ask you for this morning, how much detail did you put into the sound you want to give in praise to God? Or did you just sit there and say, oh, they're fine without me? Or 
do we want to really sing? As if our life depended on it, as if our Lord depended on it. Because His glory is what we're talking about. Do we want to pay attention to the detail of what it means in our life? When we look around, there's a lot of average, uninspired people who profess Christianity in our world, right? I mean, they're everywhere. If you ask if you're a Christian, yeah. Uh, of course I'm a Christian. What does that mean? It means uh, I believe there's a God. When's the last time you were in church? 40 years ago. Because I don't do any detail with it. And so we see this as our culture does not do the detail. Do they really have the power of God? Do you see God at work in their life and yet they want to pray and say, God, you know, I'm not sure I believe in you anymore if you don't fix all this. Well, I'll fix as much as you're paying attention to. And so if you're focused, I'll be focused. And maybe it's he's treating us like we're treating him. If we want different results, we need two things. We need to know what's stable. Do what he said. He said those things. Those are important. Keep those core values from God. No compromise. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to do those things that he tells me to. I'm going to have one God and not all kinds of others and wanting what everyone else has. I'm going to keep my anger in check. I'm going to keep my lust in check. I'm going to keep all those things under control as much as I possibly can. And we need to follow Jesus to something bigger. Because you realize Jesus did not give the Ten Commandments. I don't know if that's news to you or not, but he didn't. He went on from there expecting them to know that already. He takes the people who had been given those commandments years before, interprets the detail. He says, I don't mean just don't kill them. I mean, don't be angry with them. Don't, don't do things to them. And so I want you to understand that and realize that. And so the question becomes more about little things. So how do you love enemies? That's pretty hard to do. If you knew mine, you'd know it's hard to do, right? I imagine you're saying that back to me. I think it starts with loving children. Can you love children? Well, that's easier to do. And if you can pay attention to that one detail in learning how to love a child who is very immature, who is not doing what they should be, who's got an attitude. Yeah, I'm talking about your grandchildren. <laughs> who's doing some things that are not quite right. And maybe you can love an enemy who's doing the same thing. Because the reason they're an enemy is they didn't pay attention to detail and they're not doing things quite right and they may be immature and they are not treating you the way that you should be treated. And so start easy. Start with children because we will make an exception for them. We make no exception for enemies. And so it's a matter of learning how to do these things. Tell the truth. It's easier that way. You don't have to remember as much. And as you get older, it's much more advantageous not to have to remember as much. Keep your relationships honest and real. Change the little things, and it will change the big things. And so if you just pay attention to those things, even if it seems very, very small, it can change huge things. Sometimes it's five loaves and two fish. And you're wondering how it's going to feed everyone. Sometimes it's the side of the boat that you fish on. Sometimes it's taking a risk to get out of the boat because you're not making any progress. Sometimes it's deciding to stay even if we don't understand. We figure we'll catch up later. It's deciding to believe in a promise even when it seems completely impossible. So put in the foundation. And it's those little things that led to such huge 
realizations about God and about who God was and about what God was doing. In Matthew chapter 7, as Jesus concludes his section of teaching, if the Ten Commandments would be the Moses section, then the Sermon on the Mount would be the Jesus section, as he explains many of those, as well as gives us some other teaching. And when he comes to the end, he talks about foundation, doesn't he? Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like the wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Both houses are built the same. Both houses look the same. Both houses are equal. But one man hears and does what God told him to do. And the other one heard it. He just, eh, it's okay. I'll get to it someday. And he did not pay attention to detail. He didn't realize God was really serious. He didn't know God meant that just because he said that. After all, when you tell me things, you don't mean that, do you? Especially when it's kind of hard to do. You're not really asking for that. Do you think God isn't really asking for that? But your foundation determines how you're going to manage disaster. And Jesus seems to retell the commands, his values, and say, here's what I want you to do. When you're building a foundation, it's important that you realize the size of the building. Here's the foundation for a skyscraper. That's going to be a big skyscraper. Just the foundation's bigger than the house, right? If you've got to pour that much concrete, I think they spent 18 hours straight pouring concrete into this thing. There's a lot of things that they have to do in order to build a foundation like that. Well, what does your house take? What does your house look like? Well, it's a little bit smaller because it's not going to be as tall. It's not going to be as big. It's not going to go through as much as a huge structure that reaches into the sky with a hundred stories stacked on top of it. No, we've just got to small house and that's all we wanted really is that all you thought you were going to hit in your life and sometimes I think we build our foundation and it's the foundation for a doghouse and we don't realize what our life was going to take or how big it was going to be because the foundation is in direct response to the size of the structure you're going to have. And when the foundation crumbles, so does everything else. We didn't realize we were going to face cancer. We didn't realize we were going to run into obstacles. We didn't realize that there was going to be a disaster. That's why we live in Arizona, right? There's not very many. I know they put up those flash flood signs, but have you ever really seen one? I mean, maybe recently we've gotten a chance to look at some of those things. There will be a storm. There will be a famine. There will be a recession. You will run into things. Build your foundation big enough to handle all of those because it determines how big your life is going to be. And when your life is able to handle all of those things, then you reach some maturity. Then you reach a place where it's amazing what God's able to do. I think some people have in mind that the only thing they've got to do is keep the Ten Commandments. Or Jesus' interpretation of those. Or however we Christianize those into being, well, okay, I've got to obey this and not do that. Do you realize most of the Bible isn't written about that? It is written to reach so much further beyond that 
whether it's a prophet from the Old Testament or Paul as he writes about what Christianity is in the New Testament. He's looking for so much more than did you obey this, did you not do that, did you do this. It reaches so much further. Look at Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14. Look at the way Paul writes. This is his prayer for a church in Ephesus. Let me say this is a prayer for Mesa, for every single person here. Build your foundation so that this is what God's going to be able to give you. He says, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. What a tremendous thing. And yet we're still struggling with lying. You can't even get started if you can't tell the truth. And as he describes this kind of glory, he says, that's where I want you to be. Get the foundation down. Deal with all of those things so that now you can go on to have this glory of God, this great power of God that's at work within us, this great strength that we have, this power to understand how deep and how wide and how all of the four dimensions, not three, by the way, we see three. He says, I'm going to give you four dimensions of what the love of God is like. I want you to understand this love of Christ that passes knowledge. I'm going to let you know something that is bigger than what you could have studied, bigger than what you could ever realize or know, and I'm going to put it inside of you with the Holy Spirit so that you're grounded in it, you, that you're filled to the fullness of God. Man, how big is that? That's huge. Sometimes our goal is just, I hope I don't lie today. So much short. So let me encourage you to build that foundation and then start here to this maturity because that's where we're going. It starts with those basics of faith. And then there's some things that have to be done, and some things that have to be put in. Because God is able to do in us these incredible things. And he says, I'm just waiting to be able to work through you. What an incredible thing it was to realize the life of Paul. Because it looks so different after he met Jesus. He had the Big Ten, realize that? I mean, he had kept all of those commandments. He had taught all of those commandments. And he was out to persecute Christians until he met God. And then Jesus changed his life. Those were already core for him. He had kept those for a long time. Jesus didn't call him to keep ten commandments. Not even the revised version. He called him to a relationship. And if you look at how big the life of Paul is as he writes letters and establishes churches, how much foundation do you need to do that? That's incredible, isn't it? It's because he pays attention to detail and to what God wants of him and to what God asks of him and to every single little thing that God is trying to do. He dedicates his life because he hears what God wants. And that's where we need to go. Does your life look like you want it to today? I didn't get any hands with, oh, mine's perfect. I imagine a few of you would be delusional enough to say, oh yeah, mine's perfect, but no takers. So let me suggest we get to work. 
we got to strengthen each other. We've got to build up each other. We've got to be able to find this spirit of God that works in us. We've got to be able to find this power of God that works through his church to present such huge glory. And I know God's able to do this in all of us. We start when we first become Christians. Repenting of our sins, being baptized into Christ, putting away with those old things and then developing these new things. If you need to start, if you need prayers, if you just need to be baptized, would you come while we stand and sing?